Molly, let's start parsing the numbers game, the fundraising game. What do you make of it? So the thing I would say that is the most important thing here is that Trump said he's raised $50 million, which is like about twice what Biden raised right. two weeks ago. And, and I want to point out that Page Six did run a piece. Again, the New York Post has a lot of connections to Trump world that said Trump was jealous of Biden's event right. with the two other presidents. And you'll notice you never see Trump. It's not like George W. Bush is like, let's do events with Trump. If anything, he's quite the opposite. So it, you could see where this might get to Trump, Radio City right. Mu Music Hall, other presidents, and a lot of money. So John Paulson, who is Trump's guy, big Republican donor, decides he's going to put this together. Now the numbers are, are maybe they're huge. I mean, that number, that 800,000 number will be the max out, right? So you'll be able to, those people will be able to give to Trump PACs, but they won't be able to give to Trump campaign. What you see with the Biden numbers is that number is not the max, right? So the $220,000 ticket or the $500,000 ticket is a lot, but there's still more money to max. And remember, this is the world's longest presidential campaign. Right, we right, still have six right. more months. We are months. in March. Yeah. Uh, so if you, he's playing the catch up game now, that's right. interesting. But uh, I wouldn't, tr what I'm, the top line is, I just wouldn't take, take it Trump at, at his word. Right. At his yeah. word. We will ultimately see the numbers for this. Joanne Freeman, I, I have to say, I, I am so reminded of the conversation you and I had in the, in the days after uh, uh, January 6th in which we were discussing violence. And you know, I, I almost joked that someone like you and your specialty, uh, really relevant when Hamilton the musical came out, uh, I, I was hoping it would never be relevant again. But this, the idea of the presence of violence and the way politicians were dealing with it all seems to be forgotten now. Everybody has forgotten that this man was at the heart of a violent insurrection in this country. We were hoping the billionaires, or at least the business community, might still stick to its guns. But everybody's folding for Donald Trump now. I think there's a a sort of normalization bias where I, I think many of these billionaires assume don't have a sense of what authoritarianism is, perhaps don't fully understand what democracy is, and don't understand what an authoritarian president would look like. So I think there's an assumption that, well, they're wealthy people and they want to do things that will help wealthy people. And so they will side with Trump because they will fare better with their wealth with Trump. I'm sure some of them buy into some of his other suggestions. And right now, largely, actually, largely generally, his uh, campaign is fueled by hate. But regardless of why they're there, I think there's a normalization bias where people think, yeah, whatever, there's rhetoric, there's policy, there's whatever. We're just a normal campaign. It is, as Molly said, <laughs> it's the longest campaign. Mm -hmm. But um, still, I think there's an assumption everything is going to be fine. And I, I, I wish that people could understand the many, many ways in which Trump signals that this will not be a normal presidency, that this will be in many ways a plunge into a kind of a dictatorship where one man is important, where individual rights are not important, where free and fair elections are not important, where the rule of law is not important. And those three things, free and fair elections, the rule of law, um, and I have already just forgotten. Some, someone right. being above the law, some, you know, the president well, being well, more that, important that, than everyone that's else. That's my point. My point rights. is that my point is that um, this is a, a strike at all of those things, a strike at all three of those things, and that's the heart of democracy. And so, Molly, this is where the conversation uh, becomes problematic because we see it. He says he's going to do it, uh, and people say he's not really going to. He's just he's just he's just playing on things. The reason it didn't all work last time is because his team wasn't good enough and he wasn't smart enough. But we know about Project 2025 right. now. We know that everybody's lined up behind this enterprise to make sure they don't pay higher taxes and there isn't more regulation. And to Joanne's point, people are either wittingly or unwittingly not making the connection between your lower taxes and, and your end of democracy. Yeah, I mean, look, the problem is there's a normalcy bias. The problem is conventional framing for a normal political world that we used to live in pre-Donald right. Trump, where nor Republican candidates wanted to cut your taxes, but maybe do some stuff we didn't necessarily like. It, it, that What it does when you do conventional framing like that is it elevates the autocrat. It says these candidates are the same. You know, this guy wants to give you free health care and this guy wants to end democracy. 
you know, isn't that interesting? And that's why this framing, you cannot use it. Right. You have to understand. And I get, and I think again and again, we just have to say, none of this is normal, right? A president who says that a certain group of people are vermin, that says, I mean, you have Cash Patel saying he's going to go after the president's enemies. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not how any of this is supposed to work. And, you know, I think there's a lot of anxiety in the mainstream media of being called out as partisan. Mm -hmm. But it's but it's worth it, right? It's not partisan to be for democracy. It's not partisan to say Trump has been lying about stuff all this time, so taking him at his word yep. might be dubious at best. And I think we just have to be brave here and realize that this is, we have to, you know, democracy has to be job one here. And that may end up being taking risks as, as journalists, but I think it, it, we have to do it because the end, you know, the end could be so bad for all of us. Let's examine this a little more, um, Joanne, because Tim Snyder was having this conversation as well about how journalists should behave in this whole uh, in this whole mix. Uh, a number of my colleagues here at MSNBC over the last few weeks have articulated this. Chuck Todd said it. Uh, Rachel Maddow said it. That we are partisans for democracy. Democracy works because the press works, and vice versa. A free press works in a democracy. So we have to treat this like murder or like a hurricane. We are, we're okay saying we're not, we're not good with this. We, we don't like hurricanes because they kill people. We don't like homicide. We don't like people who work against democracy. And that is not partisan in the traditional sense. That's not Democratic, Republican partisan. Every Democrat and every Re Republican should be pro-democracy in America. Absolutely. And so alongside the normalcy bias, there's a sort of both sidesism bias as well, where you very much have to say, well, this side says X and this side says Y. And and that's where we are now in the campaign. And I you know it's a, at this point, it's said so often, it's almost a cliche that this isn't a normal campaign leading up to what might not be a normal presidency if Trump were to win. But Truly, you know, the press needs to not fall back into the familiar, which really is both sides. Here's A, here's B, here, go ahead and decide. The press should really be pointing out, here are the fundamentals of what democracy needs. Here's how this campaign ranks with it. Here's where that mm -hmm. campaign ranks with it. Wouldn't it be nice if there was an evaluation of what both campaigns are saying and just a basic discussion of how they do or don't align with what democracy actually is. I'm writing this down as you say it, because we're going to come up with that. Let's actually do that. Let's say talk about what they what these campaigns are promising to do, and not an evaluation of whether you like this policy more, but where they line up with what we think democratic values are. Thank you for that uh, good guidance. I always learn something from both of you. Thank you. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.